بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حامين والكتاب المبين انا جعلناه قرانا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون وانه في ام الكتاب لدينا لعلي الحكيم وقال تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في سوره الواقعه انه لقران كريم في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه الا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين وقال عز وجل كما ورد في سوره القيامه لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به ان علينا جمعه وقرانه فاذا قراناه فاتبع قرانه ثم ان علينا بيانه صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا الهمنا رشدنا واعذنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى امين يا رب العالمين يا برادرز اند سسترز ان اسلام السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ود ذا نيم اوف الله and invoking his blessings and help we are starting our month long program of a rapid translation of the whole of the quran and a brief explanation along with and this will go side by side with the prayer of tarawih inshallah we shall be holding inshallah four sessions of one hour each every night for today the first hour i am taking I'll try in half an hour to finish with some introduction some basic and fundamental facts and figures about Quran e Hakeem and then about half an hour for Surah Al-Fatiha and then in the second hour inshallah we shall start with Surah Al-Baqarah about Quran first of all we all believe that Quran is the word of Allah القرآن کلام اللہ اس دی سپیچ اف اللہ ورڈ اف اللہ اینڈ اٹ از پروٹیکٹڈ اینڈ پرزرڈ اٹ پروٹیکشن اینڈ پرزرویشن از گارنٹیڈ بائی اللہ ہم سیلف نمبر 2 دی ریئل اینڈ اوریجنل قران از وتھ اللہ وٹ وی ہیو ان اور ہینڈز از سو ٹو سے دی ٹیسٹڈ کاپی اف دیٹ ریئل قران that real quran is in law e mahfuz bal huwa quran majid fi law e mahfuz at another place as i have recited the ayat from surah al waqiah fi kitab al maknun the hidden book this is quran e kareem and it is in the hidden book fi kitab al maknun la yamassuhu illa al mutahharun and from there it was sent down to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam So actually, the real Quran is there. That is why I have recited the first four ayat of Surah Al-Zukhruf, Hamim wal Kitab al-Mubin. By this book, which is very clear, it is expressive of all its meanings. Inna jalnahu Quran al-Arabiyyan la'alakum taqilul, and he has made it a Quran in Arabic language. so that you can understand and here actually the addressees are the arabs who were the first addressees of quran i'll discuss this point later on inshallah wa innahu fi umm alkitab ladaina aliyyul hakim and this quran is in the mother of the books umm alkitab the real mother book ladaina it is with us aliyyul hakim and this book is exalted and full of wisdom so the real quran is with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi lahi mahfuz fi kitab maknun fi umm al kitab ladaina and these are actually the attested copies of the quran that is in lahi mahfuz from there it was sent down and this coming down of the quran was in two stages number 1 in one night 
Round about the year 610 of the Christian era, one night of the month of Ramadan, that is Laylatul Qadr, the whole of the Quran from the Law of Mahfuz and from the Ummul Kitab, as I have told you, it was sent down to the first heaven. Actually, the lowest heaven from the divine side. But from our side, it's the first heaven. The whole of this Quran was sent in that night, Laylatul Qadr. Inna anzallahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Wa ma adraka ma Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr khayru min al-fishar. Tanazzalu al-malaikatu wa ruhu fiha bi-izni rabbihim min kulli amr. Salamun hiya hatta mahla'i fajr. And this Laylatul Qadr was in the month of Ramadan. That is why we have just listened in the prayer also, in the first record of Salatul Isha, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنْدِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرَانِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَيِّنَاسِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ For this first coming down of the Qur'an, the word that is used in Qur'an is أَنْزَلْنَا أَنْزَلَ يُنْزِلُ إِنْزَالًا Because this means one piece, suddenly, sending down something at one time, one piece. So whole of the Qur'an was sent down from that law mahfuz from that kitab um from that Ummil kitab to the first heaven. Now that second stage was that from there it was sent down to the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa through Archangel Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa And it was bit by bit, ayah by ayah, surah by surah. And it took 22 long years in the complete revelation of the Qur'an to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? We all believe he was the last prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here I want to mention, he was from the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam to Ismail alayhi salatu wa sallam. And you know the history of Quraysh that belonged to the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu wa sallam. And they were settled being Ummul Qura, that is Bakka al-Mukarramah, so there actually, that is the place where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was born in the year 571 of Christian era. And when he was around about 40 years, this revelation started to him in Ghar-e Hira, in the cave of Hira. And that was the year 610, as far as we can assess and we can know. Now during these 22 years of the revelation of Quran, for about 12 years, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed at Makkah. So the amount of Qur'an that was revealed during this period is called the Makki Qur'an, Makki Surahs, and it is round about two-thirds of the whole of the Qur'an. Then he migrated in the year 622 to Madinah Munawwara, and from then till his death in 632, that is 10 years, he stayed at Madinah. But during these ten years, he was making journeys for battles also. Badr. Then he had to go even to Tabuk, that is near the border of Syria. He had to go to different parts of the Arabian desert. So actually during this whole period of ten years, the surahs and ayat of Quran which were revealed to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are called the Madani surahs. Although all of them were not revealed at Madinah properly, some of them were revealed in different places where he was on journey. But all that part of the Qur'an which was revealed during ten years after Hijrah until his death, this is called the Madani Surahs or the Madani Qur'an. Now this division between Madani and Makki Surahs or Qur'an is really agreed upon. Most of the Surahs it is agreed upon whether it is Makki or Madani. But there are slight differences of opinion about a few Surahs and then about a certain ayat also. There are examples that some ayat were revealed at Makkah, but they are included in the Madani Surah. Or some ayat were revealed at Medina, but they are included in the Bakki Surah. But as I told you, by and large, it is agreed upon between all the Muslims and scholars that this is a Makki Surah and this is a Madani Surah. An example of an important exception is Suratul Hajj. According to some people, it is Makki. According to others, it is Madani. And as far as I am able to understand, part of it is Madani, part of it is Makki, 
and some ayat. I found it later on that it was the opinion of Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas of Allah Taala and Huma that some ayat were revealed during the journey that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam undertook during his hijrah when he was going from Mecca to Medina during this period. Those ayat were revealed. So this surah. So to say, we can call it is somewhere between Madani and Makki, Surah Al-Hajj. About the rest of the surahs, as I told you, nearly there is consensus, there is agreement of opinion about whether they are Makki or Madani. Now, fifth point is, who were the addressees of the Quran? Whom Quran addressed? I want to divide this into two parts. The first and foremost addressees of the Quran, they were the pagan Arabs. Who were the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam, and Quran gives them the title of Ummiyin because they didn't have any book. There was no prophet sent to this progeny of Ibrahim after Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam. So these people, you know, they were unlettered ones. They had no education. They had no book, no law, no tradition. So they were called Ummiyin. Who were the ones who were Ummiyin and Rasulam min whom? يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُذَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ But secondly, the addresses of the Qur'an were the Jews and the Christians. So to say, they were the former Muslim Ummah. They were the Ummah of Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. They were people of the book. All of them believed in Torah. And the Jews, although they didn't believe in Injil, but they did believe in Torah, in the Old Testament. And all the scriptures of the Prophets. So actually, they are called Ahlul Kitab, people of the book, and they have been addressed in the Quran directly, and they were also the direct addressees of the Quran because many Jews were there in the Arabian Peninsula, and then you know Christians were also present in the Arabian Peninsula. To these people, Quran addresses primarily, but secondarily, whole of humanity is the addressee of the Quran. All the people, all human beings who were present in this world at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Quran addressed them also: Ya Yuhannas, O people at large; Ya Bani Adam, O progeny of Adam. So actually, the whole of humanity was being addressed, and not only those people who were present at the time of the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but also all human beings who had to come to this world till the end of this world. Till the doomsday, but they are being addressed, and they are the addressees. We may say they are by proxy. To them, this message has to be given and communicated by the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the direct approach of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he addressed directly himself the pagan Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula and the Jews and the Christians of his time. The rest of the humanity, actually, this was vision. Of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that now it's the old duty to preach and convey and communicate this message of Allah subhanahu wa taala to each and every human being till the end of this world. Therefore, most important point which I want to make is that when we ponder over Quran and we try to understand it, we should have two levels of understanding of each and every ayah. First of all. We have to keep the ayat or the surahs in the context, the historical context when they were revealed, to whom they were revealed, who were the first addressees of the Quran, to whom Quran was talking primarily, what were their ideas, what were their beliefs, what were their customs, what were their rituals. Everything has to be in the context, geo-historical context. That we call, in the term of the exegesis of the Quran, Tawilul Khas, with the special perspective of the time when they were revealed. People who were being directly addressed. If we replace the ayah or the surah in that context, and then we try to understand what was the meaning of this ayah or surah, which the people understood at that time, at that particular moment in history. And secondly, because this Quran is meant for the whole of humanity. For all times to come, it was not sent only for the Arabs. It was not sent only for the Christians or the Jews of the times of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but the whole humanity. 
So we have to understand the Quran secondarily in a generalized way. That is called the Tabirul Aam. Look to the words, what they mean, and just don't keep them bound with the historical background. And as such, you think over them, ponder over them, dive deep into their meanings, and try to generally infer from it the total and the final and the eternal guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for the humanity at large. Now, lastly, the sequence of Quranic surahs in the Mus'haf that we read and recite, and the sequence in which is what revealed, these two are absolutely different. The sequence of revelation and the sequence of the Mus'haf, the book that we have, these two sequences are absolutely different. And as we know, the Makki Surahs, basic principle is that they were revealed at Makkah. They were revealed earlier than the Madani Surahs. But we find in the Quran that the four Madani Surahs, they are in the very beginning of the Muslim. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah al imran Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Maidah. Four longest Madani Surahs are in the beginning of the Quran. Although we know they were revealed after 12 years from the beginning of the Wahi. So the sequence of Gushat and sequence of revelation, they are different. Now we must understand how Quran was collected and how it was compiled. The collection and compilation of Quran, it was completed in three stages. First of all, the Quran was compiled in a sequence during the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through the divine guidance of Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam, whenever the ayat were revealed, the Prophet said to the people who were writing these ayat, there were certain companions who were assigned the duty of writing them, Katibin e Wahi, we call them, who used to write those ayat, that put these ayat after certain such ayat of this surah. The sequence was going on as they were revealed, not in the sequence of revelation, but in the sequence of this Musaf that we have today with us. And this compilation of the Qur'an was completed in the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people have cast some doubt about it, but actually it's agreed upon, it's absolutely proven fact that the compilation was complete during the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it was done by him. But it was only in the hearts of the people. It was not in the form of a book like this. It was not collected in a book. People had remembered the whole of the Quran. And that was with the sequence. And we know it from very confirmed traditions that in every Ramadan, Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam used to come and recite the Quran. And along with him, Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also recited in the same sequence. So as Quran was being revealed, the sequence was also being fixed side by side. And in the last Ramadan of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the recitation of the whole of the Quran was completed twice. So that sequence of the surahs and ayat was completed and compilation was completed in the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although there was no book form of this Quran in the days of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it was collected in the form of a book within two or three years after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because we know it. It was done during the caliphate of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. And his period of caliphate is only two years and a few months. So within this period, this was collected in Mus'haf also, in a book form also. And then thirdly, during the time of the caliphate of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it was written down in a particular script. And that script we have now, this is called Rasul Usmani. This script was decided by Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this was also within a quarter of a century of the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you know, Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his period of caliphate is 12 years. Add to it the 12 years of Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So actually, before the completion of one fourth century, after the death of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an agreed script was also prepared, and now we have the copies of that script all over the world. This is called Ar-Rasul Usbani, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
the unit of Quran is called ayah. We don't call it a sentence. We don't call it a verse. Some of the writers use this word for Quran, but as far as I think, we shouldn't use it. We have to keep this word ayah. It's very unique. Ayah means a sign or a symbol. Actually, every ayah of Quran is a sign or symbol of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we cannot substitute any other word in its place. We have to keep it, and because during this translation of the Quran, I'll be keeping the terminology. That's why I'm explaining in the very beginning. Ayat, ayat. But if ayat, if there is full stop after that, we call it ayah. So these are fundamental things. Ayah and ayat is the same. And the plural is ayat. Now ayat, they are very small also, very large also. We have huruf e they also go to make ayah. Ha mean, it is ayah. Alif lam mean, it is ayah. Then wal asr, it is ayah. Inna linsana lafi khusu, it is again an ayah. And then there are ayat in which you can have ten sentences. Ayatul kursi, for example. A very big ayah. One of the biggest ayat of the Quran. So actually, these ayat, they are not based on any principle of logic or grammar. This is based on as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us. And we call it in this terminology, tawqifi. These matters are tawqifi. They are maqoof alayh on the telling of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As he told, we accept it. No reason, no principle, no logic, no grammar. Now these ayat, you may note here, there are about 6,656. There is some difference in number. But round about 6,500 ayat of the Quran, whole. Now these ayat, second term is surah, and the plural is suwar. But this word is because it's not commonly used. I'll be using the word surah and surah during this translation. And what is surah? Surah is not a chapter. Please note, these terms are not applicable to the Quran. These terms which we use about the books generally, sentences, paragraphs, there are no paragraphs in the Quran. Then there are no chapters. This is not chapter. Because in chapter of a book, there must be a certain topic, and that topic should be discussed in that chapter alone. It shouldn't be repeated in the second chapter, or again in the third chapter. But we find in the Quran that even the story of Adam and Iblis, it has been repeated in seven surahs of the Quran. So actually it's a unique book. It's not the common book as we know the word book. This is a unique book in itself. And it has its own compilation, its own style, its own terminology. So ayat, then the ayat are joined together in surahs. There are 114 surahs of the Quran. And these surahs, you know, are very small also. Three surahs are there who have only three ayat each. Walaq, inna linsana lafi khut, illa alladheena amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawaswa bil haqqi wa tawaswa bil sabr. Surah is complete. In the same way, inna aqaynaaka al-kawsar, fa salli li rabbika wal haq, inna shaniyaka huwa al-aftar. Surah is complete. And on the other hand, we find Surah al-Baqarah, 286 ayat. And among these 286 ayat, there are certain ayat which are so long that Ayatul Kursi is at least three times bigger than Suratul Atma. So actually these sizes are also dependent upon what the Prophet Sallallahu told us. These are Tawqifi Umur, not based on any logic, not based on any principle. The only principle is that the Prophet told us this is Suratul Baqarah. Starts from here and here. This is Surah Al Imran. Starts from here and here. It is small or large. Nothing to do with any number, any size, any principle of grammar. But as far as the contents are concerned, there are principles. Every surah has a central theme. And all the ayat of that surah, they are connected with that central theme logically. They are absolutely logical relationship. But not as we find in our chapter. It's complete in itself, self-sufficient in itself. Then one point is note, and that is, most of the surahs of the Qur'an are in pairs. Suratul Baqarah, Suratul Al-Imran, a pair. 
In the same way, Musaf ends with Mu'awwaza Tain. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Very similar to each other. That's a pair. In the same way, Wadduha wa layli za sajah. Alam nasha laka sabrak. Same thing being discussed in both the surahs. Addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam personally. It's a pair. Very apparently a pair. In the same way, Ya ayuhal muzdammil, Qum illa ila illa qalila. Ya ayuhal muddassir, Qum fa'anzir. It is again a pair. So most of the surahs of the Qur'an are in pairs. Although there are surahs which are not in pairs, they are unique. Such surahs are very important. But actually referring to these things during our translation, that is why I want to acquaint you with these basic terminology. Now these big surahs have been divided into rukus. This division was not present at the time of the Prophet or during the days of the Sahaba. It was done later on during the Umayyad period. And by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, he is the person who divided the bigger surahs of the Qur'an into rukus. Why? Because you know you can't recite the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah in one attack in the prayer. So there must be portions. So you can recite them in your prayers. So for that purpose, one ruku for every rakat. The root is the same. Raka, rakat, and ruku. So you can recite one ruku. So one subject is discussed in one ruku. So this was done later on, but it was not present in the days of the Prophet or of the companions. In the same way, when the whole of the Qur'an was divided into 30 parts, which we call parar, and parts in Qur'an. This division also was done later on, and we don't know when it was done. But it definitely was not present in the days of the Prophet wasallam or of the companions. This was to facilitate the Muslims, so that every Muslim can read and recite one para, one part of the Qur'an, every day, so that each month he completes one recitation of the whole of the Qur'an. But these two terms, rukus and paras or pars, they were introduced later on. They were not present during the days of the Prophet wasallam or of the companions But then another word which we find in ahadith, that is fism. The surahs of the Qur'an, they were grouped in such a way the Qur'an was divided or divisible into seven nearly equal parts, not exactly equal. Some hizm is more than five paras. First hizm is more than five paras. Some is less. Because if you divide thirty parts and you divide into seven, what will come? About four and a half each. But we have somewhere it is four and a quarter, somewhere it is about four, somewhere it is more than five as I told you. But the beauty is, and this word was present during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, because people who had more love for Qur'an, they used to complete the recitation of the Qur'an in every week. So they had to divide Qur'an in seven parts, so that they can complete the recitation of the Qur'an in one week. So we find the beauty is that the surahs are complete. They are not broken in this division into ahzab, or manzil as we call it generally, and the azab, this is the Arabic word mostly used. We have three surahs in the first. If you leave alone Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the preface of the whole of the Qur'an, then three surahs. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, one manzil, one hiz. Then five in the next, seven in the next, nine in the next, eleven in the next, and thirteen in the next and then sixty-five surahs in the seventh hizm. That is also a multiple of thirteen. Thirteen into five makes sixty-five. So actually there is a beauty, numerical beauty, as well as, you know, a gradual increase. Three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and then sixty-five. So this was also present, this division of the Qur'an, into seven ahzab, or seven manazil, during the days of the Prophet Lastly, there is another grouping of these surahs. And incidentally, this is also in seven groups. These seven groups are groups of Makki and Madani surahs. We find in the Quran one or two Makki surahs, then one or more Madani surahs, it becomes one group. 
then two or three or one or two Makki Surah, then some Madani Surah, second group. Then Makki, then Madani, third group. Again Makki, again Madani, fourth group. Again Makki, again Madani, so on. These are also seven groups. We find in the first group, Surah Al-Fatiha is the only Surah which is Makki. Only one. Then four longest Madani Surahs, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, Surah Al-Maida, and this goes to make the first group. This is not first manzil, first group of Madani Surahs. Then we have two Surahs which are Makki, Surah Al-Anam, Surah Al-Araf. Again two Surahs which are Madani, Surah Al-Anfal, Surah Al-Tawba, this is the second group. Then in the third group, we have fourteen surahs which are Makki, starting from Surah Al-Yunus, ending with Surah al muminun and only one surah, which is Madani, and that is Surah Al-Nur. Then eight surahs which are Makki, again one surah which is Madani, Surah Al-Ahzab, so on. Then again thirteen surahs which are Makki, and then three surahs, Surah Al-Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-Fat, Surah Al-Hujrat, these are the Madani surahs. Then you know from Surah Al-Qaf, Till Surah al waqiah they are Bakki Surahs. From Surah al hadid to Surah al tahrim these are the Madani ten Surahs. And this is the sixth group. And finally, it's nearly whole of it is Makki Surahs, from Surah Al-Mulk to Surah Al-Ikhlaq. Only the last two Mu'abbazatayn, they are the Madani Surahs. And they are very meaningful. Every group has a central idea, central theme. And the one aspect of that subject is discussed in the Bakki Surahs. The other aspect of the same subject is discussed in the Badari Surah of the same group. So this is the basic terminology because it will be repeated time and time again during my translation of the Quran. And when I want to explain what is the meaning of those ayat and surahs. So this terminology is going to be repeated. That is why I wanted to acquaint you with the basic terminology before we start it. And now we start with Surah Al-Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Ameen. This surah, the first point that should be noted is, this is the first complete surah revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before this surah, there were isolated ayat which were revealed. No complete surah was revealed to Muhammad before Surah Al-Fatiha. Five ayat in the beginning of Surah Al-Alaq. Iqra bismi rabbika al-lazhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, al-lazhi allama bil-qalam, allama l-insana ma'alam ya'alam. First revelation. Second, the first seven ayat of Surah Al-Noon or Surah Al-Qalam. That is the second surah of 29th part. First seven ayat. Third, the beginning of Surah Al-Muzzammil. Fourth, the first seven ayat again of Surah Al-Muddathir. And as far as I think, and as far as many scholars have the opinion, fifth revelation was Surah Al-Fatiha. And it was the first surah which was revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complete. It consists of seven ayat. This number is agreed, although there is a difference in counting. Some people include ayatul Bismillah in this counting. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ayah number one. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, ayah number two. And they found the last, Sirat al-Lazeen anamta alayhim, ghairi al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhaleen as one ayah. So the total comes to seven. But in the second opinion, and this is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and I also agree with this second opinion. I will let you know the reason of that later on. Ayatul Bismillah is not included in Surah Al-Fatiha. This is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah. This is actually a sign that the Surah is beginning. And this is placed between all the Surahs of the Quran except Surah Al-Tawbah 
it has no ayat in Bismillah in the beginning or before it. Rest 113 surahs of the Quran, before those surahs, this ayah has been written. It's only a sign that the that surah is beginning and the preceding has ended here. That's all. And this is not included and most of the people don't count it every time. Anyhow, Bismillah rahman rahim is not the ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha starts with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, second ayah. Maliki Yawm al-Din, third ayah. Iyaka Nabudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, fourth ayah. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, fifth ayah. Sirat al-Lazeen Alamta Alayhim, separately, ayah number six. Very Al-Maghdubi Alayhim wa Al-Dhalim, separately, ayah number seven. This is the second mode of counting. Please note that seven, this is agreed upon. That Surat Al-Fatiha consists of seven ayahs. But the mode of counting is different. Thirdly, this surah has many names. And it was the custom with the Arab people. The thing which they liked more, they gave it more names. This surah, because this is a very important surah of the Quran, very basic surah, more than 50 names have been enumerated by Jalaluddin Sayyuti Rahimahullah. In his very famous book, Al-Ifqan, Fi Ulum Al-Quran. But the most important are Al-Fatiha. Why? Fataha Yaftahu means to open something. Miftah means the key to open the lock. Fataha Yaftahu to open something. Al-Fatiha, the opening surah of the Quran. So this is actually the name which is most commonly known and commonly used. And this is very meaningful because with this Quran begins as if it is opening the Quran. The opening surah of the Quran al Fatiha. Ummul Quran, Asasul Quran. There are so many names. Al Kafiya, Al Shafiya. As I told you, 50 names have been enumerated by Jalaluddin Sayyuti Rahimahullah. So these are the different names. There is a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, narrated by Hazrat Umayy ibn Kaab radiallahu ta'ala. He is an Ansari Sahabi. And the Prophet وسلم, gave him the title. Akraw Sahaba, Akraw Hum Umayy ibn Kaab. Among my Sahaba, the one who is most knowledgeable about Quran is Umayy ibn Kaab, رضي الله تعالى So there is a hadith narrated by him in which the Prophet ﷺ has been reported to have said that this is the biggest and this is the most important surah of the Quran. And like this surah, no surah was revealed before it, neither in Torah, nor in Injil, nor in Quran itself. This is unique and this is most profound. So this is actually about his grandeur, importance, his profoundness. This hadith is very important. Then this surah is in the form of a prayer. Although it's Karamullah, but actually what is it? It's the prayer taught to us. We address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to this surah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Only thee we shall obey and serve. And only thee we ask for help. So actually we are addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to this surah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us this dua, this prayer. And that is why this is the real prayer. This is the real salah. That is why the Prophet said, La salata liman lam yakra bi surat al-fatiha, bi fatiha al-kitab. Whosoever doesn't recite this surat al-fatiha in his prayer, he has no prayers at all. He has not prayed at all. So actually this is an integral part of our prayer. That is why we repeat it in every rakah. The full surah is repeated in every rakah. So actually what is the style of this surah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah has actually represented the position of a human being whose nature is non-polluted, unperverted, and who has the faculty of right thinking. He can reach by his own thinking and ponderance and meditation. He can reach the conclusion that there is a creator of this universe. And he is Rahman and Rahim. And secondly, that we shall have to return to him for the rewards of our actions, or punishments of our misdeeds. 
these things you know they are so much simple and so much known absolutely known and apparent to the human nature that every human being who thinks in a right way in a straight line who has the faculty of reasoning in a straight line who can use his logic in a very straight manner and number 2 his nature is unpolluted unperverted he will reach this conclusion there is some creator that creator is most benevolent most compassionate most merciful then he has created us and he has produced in us a moral law a moral sense we know by our nature something is wrong something is right something is good something is bad when there is this knowledge this moral law within ourselves it cannot go unrewarded there must be some reward and that reward we don't find in this world so there should be another life so these are the basic things to which a human being if he is good natured and if he has the right thinking he is salimul aql he will be this conclusion but now he has to ask for guidance what should i do where should i go but things are actually harmful for me i don't know i want to please you allah how should i do it i want to worship you oh my creator i want to know you i want to love you i want to obey you i want to please you but how should i do it that is actually the call of the nature and this call of the nature has been given these wordings by allah subhanahu wa taala and they have been given to us in the form of surah al-fatiha just as we shall find inshallah today in the fourth section of surah al-baqara that when hazrat adam alayhi salatu was salam committed a sin he disobeyed allah subhanahu wa taala he ate the fruit of the forbidden tree then there was within him a sense of guilt he wanted to apologize he wanted to repent he wanted to ask allah for his forgiveness but he didn't have the words with which should i ask the forgiveness of allah subhanahu wa taala and we find in that section fatalaqa adam min rabbihi kalimatin fataba alayh when allah subhanahu wa taala found in him that he is now feeling guilty he is now sorrowful he is now sorry why i committed this mistake he wants to apologize to me he wants to ask my forgiveness then allah subhanahu wa taala taught him the words fatalaqa adam min rabbihi kalimatin fataba alayh ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين in the same way if we imagine a person who is right minded who is right natured good natured person who wants to lead a simple and right life but he wants to know what to do and what not to do he wants to have the guidance now actually his feeling have been given these wordings by allah subhanahu wa taala alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar rahmanir rahim maliki yawmid din iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladhina an'amta alayhim ghairil maghdubi alayhim walad dallin so these are the wordings from allah subhanahu wa taala but the feelings of a man a good natured man who wants to have the guidance so that is actually the style of this surah fatiha That is why there is a hadith, very beautiful hadith, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, and it has been narrated by Hazrat Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu taala. This hadith gives us a very beautiful analysis of Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has been reported to have said, "Fasm tu salat a baini wa bain abdi nisfain." I have divided the prayer, that is Surah Al-Fatiha, between myself. and my bonds man in two halves for this for hali for this for hali abdi half of the prayer is for me and the rest of the half is for my bonds man wale abdi ma taal and i grant for my bonds man what he has asked me and then there is a detailed description when a person says idha qala al abd alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin yaqul allah taala hamidani abdi when you know we say but if we say it from the depths of our hearts not only repeating the words only but our feeling when we say alhamdulillah rabbil alamin simultaneously allah says 
Habedani Abdi, my bondsman has praised me. And when the bondsman says, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Allah says, Yaqulullah Ta'ala, Isma Alayya Abdi, my bondsman has spoken high of me. When the bondsman says, Malik Yawmiddin, Yaqulullah Ta'ala, Majjadani Abdi, Allah says, my bondsman has glorified me. Now these three ayats are absolutely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the praise of Allah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all praise be for Allah, who is the master and the creator and the sustainer of all the worlds, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, His benevolent, compassionate, merciful, Malik Yawmiddin, and He is the sole authority on the day of judgment, on the day of reward. He is the sole authority. He is the master of the day of judgment. Now this is actually three ayat. They are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praising Allah. Now the fourth ayah. This is actually a bond, a covenant between Allah and the bondsman. That is why you see these first three ayat. According to the Arabic grammar, they go to make one sentence. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. Actually, this is one sentence. Although ayat are three, sentence is one. But in the fourth ayah, Iyaka Nabud, it's a complete sentence. Wa Iyaka Nasta'im, another complete sentence. It is comprised of two sentences. O oh Allah, only thee we worship, only thee we serve, only thee we obey. And we shall translate it into future tense also. Because in Arabic, Fale Muzara, it includes present and future tenses both. Only thee we worship, and only thee we shall continue to worship. Only thee we serve, and only thee we will continue to serve. Only thee we obey, and only thee we will continue to obey. And in the same manner, and only thee we ask for help, and only thee we shall ask for help. We shall not ask help, we shall not invoke any other body. We shall ask help of you and you alone. Vayyat and Asta'id. Now this is something in between the two. First three ayat for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is when the bondsman says according to this hadith, Iyat and Abud Vayyat and Asta'id, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hada ma baini wa baini abdi wa li abdi ma sal. This is between me and my bondsman. And I have granted for my bondsman what he has asked. Iyat and Asta'id. We want your help. He wants my help, I grant him my help. And then now the last three ayahs, and that is why I told you I agree with the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa that these ayahs are three, not two. Ejjad of Sirat al Mustaqeem. Guide us on the right path. Sirat al Lazir al Amtale. Sentence is one. These three ayahs also go to make one sentence. Ejjad of Sirat al Mustaqeem, Sirat al Lazir al Amtale, him, Ghair al Mahdoud al Lahim, and Abba al Lid. The rules of Arabic grammar, they go to comprise only one sentence. Although the ayat are either two, as enumerated by a certain group, or three, as enumerated by the other people. And I am agreeing with the second opinion. Ejjana Sirat al Mustaqeem. Guide us on the right path. Sirat al Lazina Nam Alayhi. Path of those whom you blessed. Where is Maghzub Alayhi Walla Who didn't have your wrath and your punishment? and who didn't go astray. So actually, this is explaining the same thing. Ayyadina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Lazeen anamta alayhim, wairil maghzubi alayhim wa labba alayhim. And that hadith of Qudsi says, when the bondsman says these words, Ayyadina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Lazeen anamta alayhim, wairil maghzubi alayhim wa labba alayhim. Then Allah says, Haza li abdi wa li abdi maasal. This is for my bondsman, and I grant to my bondsman what he has asked for. So actually, I had, you know, made a diagram of a balance. A balance has, what should we call it, a stick, the two sides. And we have three ayat on one side. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmin Deen. And then they are attached to that central beam. And with the Iyaka Na'bud. Wa is in between, where you hold the balance. That is Wa. And from Wa, the second side of that beam, and with this we have these three ayat, 
اہدن السلاط المستقیم سراط الزین عنم تعلیم غیر المغضوب علیہ ولبالین ویری سیمیٹریکل ویری بیلنس قسم تو سلاط بینی و بین عبدی نسخین آئی ہیو ڈیوائیڈڈ دی پریئر بٹوین مائی سیلف اینڈ مائی بونڈ مین انٹو ٹو ہاف نسوحالی و نسوحال عبدی ہاف از فار می and half is for my bondsman wale abdi masal and i have granted to my bondsman what he has asked for and in the end we say ameen what does it mean o oh allah accept our request o oh allah be it as we have requested you so let it be so as we have requested you to do so that is actually ameen and that is the only difference of opinion is that some people pronounce it with a loud voice others they just pronounce it with a very low voice but we have to say ameen whether jahran or with ikhfa but that is agreed upon that we must say it in the end of this surah al-fatiha aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin wal muslimat